I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tell. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with the hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Gavir with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with episode 568. We welcome you to Inside the HBCU Sports Lab radio show and podcast, a show that's covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports for institutions large and small from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture. HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs and the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Yada Cavill, along with my co-host, Charles Bishop, and we have a collage of other individuals joining us, including Dave. He's in the building. Brian is in the house. And we also brought in Brandon to make sure that he could shake a tail feather. His, he's kind of happy up there in front of his team when they did in D.C. <laughs> Would it be interesting show, gentlemen? Let me first say, you know, um, Charles. Yeah. <clears throat> what's your thoughts on the ledge right now? Uh, well, first and foremost, good morning, Doc, on this beautiful, glorious Sunday. <laughs> uh, I mean, the birds are chirping. The sun is just that much brighter. What a wonderful Sunday. Uh, we got a full ledge today. We got to get into it. It's, it's, it's we got some people trying to hold folks back today, but that ledge is full today. <laughs> it's full today. You got to, ooh, ooh, you feel the, the gravity pulling folks down today. <laughs> Brandon, tell pull them off the ledge, Brandon, and tell them just to pivot to basketball. I know some folks have already turned ahead to the basketball arena. Gymnasiums are just looking at the hardwood. You got the hardwood. Get off that ledge. <laughs> The plug, Dr. Cavill, the plug, the plug. Club <laughs> Corbett. Yes, time Love to get the club. <laughs> Especially after a long, old oh, coming Saturday. Some of us know how to hit the club. With that being said, we're filming from our home studios and getting it down in beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. We have a lot of these folks in the airport. Some of them found a way to sneak back home after leaving the airport. Some of them just had a hard time waking up this morning because they watched it all on the television. We're going to give you updates, insights, uh, scores. We'll even release the major division polls. We got some shakeups. We'll see what it looks like today, what happened. Today's episode of Inside the HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting, educational, and data analytics. With that being said, uh, let me give you an update for Dave and Brandon. You know, y'all can vote on the poll. Charles, you're welcome to vote on the poll. You can see it's in your top 10 every Saturday, then major and major or one or the other. I know some of y'all just kind of get cranic when you're Saturday going and things <laughs> not going right. You don't want to vote. You just abdicate your responsibilities. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, Dave, how you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing good, man. My voice is still shot from last night. You know, you know, it was a it was a tough game to say the least at homecoming, but it was a good week. I, I flew in on Wednesday, did some sports stuff on Thursday. Nice. You know, I went to go see the kid, get with the students on Friday, talking about top five things of that sort, and saw what I saw Saturday afternoon, and went to the bonfire Saturday night, and I'm at the airport today. Let me say, man, you look you look handsome there. That's a nice pullover, man. You, you represent well. I like it. That's how you travel through the airports. I like that. Good look. Good look. Absolutely. Brandon, how are you doing this morning? I'm man, doing great. Like a Chester Cheetah Cheese Cat. Man, what, what? <laughs> like Charles said, it's a beautiful day outside. It's not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> the air is birds chirping in Nashville, too. Huh? Okay. <laughs> It's just, it's just crisp. It's, it's just a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. I can't. I can't say the same for 
for our friends up in DC. But for us, it was it was an amazing weekend. Amazing. <laughs> he sounded like he's not ready to go to church. Y'all enjoyed their homecoming. I like that. <laughs> Brian, how you doing this morning? It's raining. It's raining here in Florida. There's dark clouds. Uh, it's cold. So and, and that's, I mean, that's, I'm literal. I'm very literal about that. Go look at the weather in Central Florida. It is literal. So God is God is not uh, He's not smiling on us Floridians right now. But, you know, that's just how it goes sometimes on some Saturday mornings. Oh, it does. Well, let me give I remember you remember brighter days. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. As I said, uh, you don't have to pivot as quick uh, to basketball. You got a little time for that. You're still in the mix. Uh, but that's saying, you know, scoot a little big back from that ledge, though. You're making me nervous, Brian. You're making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me get you these score updates from mid-major and let you know what went uh, down based on our top seven poll rankings, and we'll talk with those teams receiving votes. Uh, receiving votes in the mid-major last week, and that is week number uh, six, if you would. Fort Valley State Wildcats, they came in just outside of the top seven and had the most votes there. They lost the South Carolina State Bulldogs. Um, not surprised that they lost, but um, that the fact that the Bulldogs, I thought, made a significant statement was pretty big. That's a, basically a top ten uh, program in Fort Valley State Wildcats. Uh, they went up the road, if you would, and they lost 30-3. to three. Shaw Bears lost to number one Johnson C. Smith Golden Bulls as the Bulls Golden Bulls' magical season continues. They win 21-14. to Kind of push Shaw Bear out of their misery as the Bears fall to 4-3, and 2-2. And, and I should have said the Wildcats fall to 4-2-4, four and two and four, stay at 4-1 and one in a conference race. Virginia State Trojans, um, they defeat the Elizabeth City State Vikings 36-7, dominate that. They're playing some pretty good football now after stumbling a little bit early. They are 3-3 three and three on the season and 2-1 and one as they enter in the final stretch of the Seattle race. Let's get into the top seven where we did have a couple of top seven matchups, including this first one at number seven. The Miles Golden Bears go to Clark Atlanta and destroy uh, the homecoming festivities uh, and really beat up on the Panthers, 49 to 28. So they improved to find two. More importantly, they have sole control of the SIC race, five and two. This is after starting out 0 and two. They've taken five straight victories uh, as they just jumped in the top seven last week. Well, now they're rolling. At number six, the Livingston Blue Bears lost to the number four, Winston-Salem State Rams, 31 to 17. Good showing uh, by the Rams, not so much by Blue Bears. Their magical season kind of takes a thump. Uh, and bump in the road mark. They're five and three, three and two as they fall to in the conference race. At number five, told you about those Clark Atlanta Panthers. They lost to number seven then. Uh, Miles Golden Bears, as we said, 49 and 28. So they fall to a overall record of five, two and one. And even more crucial in the conference race, they fall to four and two. Bringing us to number four, told you about this one, Salem State Rams. Uh, they hold steady. They're at number six. <coughs> 31 to 17. They are clearly in the race uh, for the CIAA as they improved to 6 and 2 overall and 4 and 1. At number 3, Virginia Union Panthers defeat Lincoln, Pennsylvania Lions 6 to 3 to 12. Uh, they are 5 and 2 and 4 and 0 oh overall. Yes, they had a loss against a conference opponent, but because they play in eight CIAA games and only seven count, that one for them did not count in the conference standings. So that is fascinating to see how that goes. West Virginia State Yellow Jackets lost to Wheeling. A close one here. Many people said they wasn't just in the Yellow Jackets. Well, they couldn't get the sting uh, going against Wheeling as they lose 35-33. to They fall to 5-2, and 4-1 and one in the conference race. And Johnson C. Smith, Golden Bulls, as I told you, against Shaw, essentially the number nine team. They beat them 21-14, to 7-0, 4-0. They're rolling. Uh, and they have three more. With that being said, Charles, any thoughts in terms of the CIAA scores? Uh, I mean, absolutely. The Winston-Salem State score uh, sticks, sticks out for me. When you take a look at Winston-Salem State over Livingston, uh, that was, a, I thought, a, a, a great win. Winston-Salem State further legitimizes them in terms of being one of the top-tier teams <laughs> in that conference. Uh, and uh, like you said, I think Virginia State, they've gotten back, gotten back on solid footing. So those are uh, great wins. John C. Smith and Shaw, great game, 21-14. Uh, like you said, John C. Smith, they continue on that uh, magical ride that they're on. So that was some uh, 
Good action yesterday, Doc. All right, Brian, your thought in terms of the mid-major division. Any scores stick out to you? Um, yeah, I, actually, it, it, um, it's funny you say that because I, I'm just thinking about, you know, it kind of, I feel like a lot of, of those games kind of went chalk like I thought they would, to be honest. I was really impressed, though. I was checking outside of the SIC and the CIAA. West Virginia State. West Virginia State lost a game. Obviously, they were on a four-game winning streak, I believe. Lost the game by two in the last 20 seconds, uh, a road game. And so, you know, just kind of that one kind of stuck out in my head, a game that they – against one of their better conference teams, opponents. And so, um, you know, good, good win. I mean, or a good loss, uh, if there is such a thing. But uh, – I think for a team that that has that has struggled to kind of find their place in that conference, I, I'm interested to see how they how they handled the rest. And and uh, Johnson C and Winston Salem State, I guess two worlds are colliding. Um, I, I guess that's is what we got. Uh, two worlds are colliding. So mm -hmm. as I saw Steve said, bear, bear hunting season is over for the Rams. <laughs> so now they got to go. Now they got to deal with some bulls. Yeah, it should be fascinating to close out the season. We certainly will get into that next segment as you kind of hinted that. And it makes for a big closing stretch, particularly this weekend coming up, big time matchup. Brandon, with that being said, what are your thoughts on the mid major? Anything for you that has you saying, hmm, or are you just um, like, I think I Miles quick. getting a fifth straight win mm. uh, on Saturday? Yeah. You know, uh, they, they, like I said, starting off 0 2, and they just kind of went about their business quietly. Stacking up SIAC wins, and you and you look up, and right now they're in control uh, of the conference. Um, and and when you look at who's going to get to the championship game, you're gonna have to go through miles, uh, is what it's looking like to get there. Um, <clears throat> and and kind of sneakily still in the mix, of course. Uh, Albany State they beat the brakes off Morehouse, which was to be expected. Um, so. You know, you look at it and and they're still right there uh, in the mix. It seems like almost every year. So right. with, again, as we know, the SIAC has eliminated division. So <clears throat> this next uh, few weeks is, is as they say on drumline, tree shaking elimination because we're gonna find out uh, the pretenders and 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 the the contenders is gonna uh, bear itself out. Um, kind of just moving over a little bit to the uh, CIAA. Um, I think. I had I had previously written on sneakershoptalk.com. Definitely go over there, check it out. Shameless plug. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> talking about Shaw as one of the surprise stories in the in the CIAA, and I think the surprise is kind of over with. Um, they they've taken some bumps and bruises. They still have bested their win total from last year, but I think Great point. their their moment in terms of contention, barring a lot of help, is probably over with. So they went from a surprising story um, to a nice story to where they, they their program is still kind of ascending with them uh, beating their win total uh, from last year. So those were, um, as I look at the, the mid-major, those were a couple of things that, that stuck out to me. <clears throat> I like that as a writer, surprising story to a nice story. Well put. <laughs> Dave, what you got on your mind? <laughs> I'm going to be quick about Division about division 2. Um Who's going to stop John C. Smith? That's the like, question. The that is the question today for me. Like I, they're so they're so well rounded across the board from my perspective. So I'm just trying to figure out could Winston do it? I don't see it yet, but I know we're going to preview it later. But I mean, that's the big thing for me. Like, who is going to stop John C. Smith? I like that question. Like, Very good question. With that being said, let's look into the major division. Uh, starting receiving votes, you had Alabama State Hornets. Uh, they did not play Hampton Pirates. They defeat North Carolina a t State Aggies 59-17. to This is after uh, Aggies jumped out to 14-0 to really excite their fan base at homecoming, full stadium. But uh, it was not to be as Hampton just rolled back. Alabama a and the Bulldogs, they did not play. I'm going to give a little score here. Dropping out last week was Grambling State Tigers. They uh, did defeat UAPB Golden Lions 31 to 21, a final there. Let's get in to see what those top seven programs did. You have 
Howard Bison at seven. They lost to the number two Tennessee State Tigers, 27-14. That's three and four there. At number six, you have Alcorn State Braves. They lost to uh, Southern uh, as they were down there for Southern's homecoming. The Jaguars ran all over the Braves, 24-14. It was nip and tuck back and forth for most of the game, uh, but late plays by the Jaguars as they've done of late, got it done. And the, Jag- uh, the Braves fall to four and four, three and one in the conference race. At number five, South Carolina State Bulldogs defeat Fort Valley State Wildcats. We told you about that in the mid-major. They are rolling now, 4-2, as they start to get in the conference play. Should be interesting. At number four, you have Jackson State Tigers. They defeat number three, Florida and the Rattlers, 35-21. Classic matchup. It was 21-20 late in that game. Jackson State got a fumble, a sack fumble, if you would, for a touchdown, and then scored a late one to really have the control in that matchup. So Jackson State improves the 5-2, and 3-0, and oh, getting it done there. Number three, just told you about those rattlers. They fall to 3-3, three and 1-1 three, one and one with that loss. Uh, and number one, North, <clears throat> excuse me, number two, Tennessee State Titans. Defeat number seven, Howard Bison, 27-14. That was in the Mecca, and it was Howard's homecoming. Uh, and they made a statement, I think, with the Tigers there. North Carolina Central Eagles, they just watched everybody play around with the food. They did not play their 5-2, and 1-0. and oh. We'll see what that means. Eight first-place votes uh, as they hold on the number one spot. They have the bullseye as they even have a heads-up in the conference. MEAC races, they had that game in Circle City Classic against Norfolk State, and so they're 1-0 and oh in the MEAC race as things Start to go forward. We'll get a little more into that MEAC race and see what you think of some of those first matchups. But with that being said, Dave, I'm going to let you hold it down first. What are your thoughts in terms of the major division? Um, I want to give kudos to Jackson State for getting it done. Um, again, Florida a and mainly because I feel like, from my perspective, I think that was a swag championship I know. The West Pants got to play the East Pants, but I thought that was pretty much the game for me that they, that pretty much gives them on the rest of the celebration ball, so to speak. Um, so they did excellent. Uh, when it comes with regards to what happened between Hampton and A&T, it was just A&T was unprepared again this week. Um, and that's what it boiled down to it for me, based on what I saw. Uh, so uh, the, another game that was fascinating was the fact that Tennessee State is calling how it's homecoming their second homecoming, so that's kind of rough. I will say that. <laughs> I think you make some good points. Brandon, since he brought it up, let's go to you, Tom. What's going on to you? I wonder what game will I start with. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> obviously, so uh, when when the game, when I, when I was doing my preview of the game, uh, you can go check it out. Um, I was, it was actually looking at it initially from the outside looking at it, it was kind of tough to predict for the reason you don't know what Howard team you're going to see. If, if bad Howard shows up, then it should be a fairly easy day at the office for Tennessee State. If good Howard shows up, then they're in for a dogfight. Um, TSU got off um, to a, a, a good start and and where I thought Howard was really able to make a lot of hay was with the run game, which is kind of what I thought that would happen. Um, I thought that if Tennessee State could get out to maybe uh, a multiple score lead that would necessitate them, and when I say them, I mean Howard having to throw the football more, I thought that would really play into their hands. And I think it did when you look at <clears throat> Howard having 28 yards passing and this is no knock to, to Jay Sean Scruggs. He's he is a gamer. If if and, and we've seen it in, in previous games, him making critical plays uh, to help this team win. But if you're looking for him to, to drop back, you know, 25 to 30 times and pitch it all over the yard, then you're in trouble. And uh, we saw a little bit of that. So I miss a, a few uh, throws that, that really hurt. Um, and even with that, I think that, that kick return, that 99-yard kick return after Howard scored, um, it was kind of like Isaiah Thomas has said when we was up by three and they hit a, a three in the fourth quarter to go up by six, and that's kind of the game. <laughs> when, he, when, when they ran that kickoff back, you could kind of see that kind of deflated and took the air out of, out of Howard's sails, and it was all over but the shouting uh, at that point. 
We'll get uh, into so, some more talk in the, in the next segment, but let me go to Brian and get your thoughts in terms of the top seven at the major division this week. Um, good wins for, you know, uh, Southern. Good wins for Tennessee State. Uh, let me see. How about – let me see. Who else? Oh, yeah. Good win, Jackson State. Yeah, good win. just waiting. He's like, are you back on top of the game? Hey, I'm sitting around like, well, maybe about to talk about Grambling and the UAPB. I- <laughs> <laughs> oh, for real, though. Hey, uh, game of the year. Uh, you know, been hyping it up all season. Yep. And, yes, uh, for me, even though the, the game, the, the results didn't go – the way I would have liked them to go, it was a game that lived up to game yeah. of the year hype. You had you had a, an outstanding first half, big plays. I mean, b- match for match. Jackson State come up with a big play, fam, you answered. Then you had that third and fourth quarter. You had that third quarter where you had defensive plays, you had turnovers, uh, you, you had the anxiety of we got a one-point game and how long is this game going to stay as a one-point game? I mean, that that was fascinating given what we had in the first half, that, that entire third to the middle of the fourth quarter, that that game just kind of stalled out offensively. That was surprising, and I'm sure it was surprising for Jackson State, equally surprising for FAMU. And then all good games have to have a dramatic conclusion, and there can be no more dramatic conclusion then what happened on a third down? You're up one. I know everybody's thinking, oh, run the ball, run the ball, run the clock. Oh, no, we're passing. Oh, no, he just got sacked. And, I mean, I, if I was in my younger days, I would have thrown glasses at a wall, but <laughs> I would have taken it as hard as I could hit it these days at my age. And I'm just like, oh, yes. Uh, you know, no, he didn't just fumble. Uh, I think it even caught Tiffany off guard because she, in the broadcast, was like, Wait a minute, did that just happen? He's right. How much is happening? Oh, touchdown. I'm like, oh my God, of all the worst scenarios. But that's what a game of the year provides. And then you get the late extra touchdown. So if you're a Jackson State, you know, backer, I mean, you were happy because you, you covered the spread and you hit the over. And I mean, you know, that, that's a, at the end of the day, <laughs> where people are really happy. Jackson State people happy because they're like, oh, we won, but hey, we covered and we took the over. <laughs> Yay for us. So game of the year lived up to it. I don't yeah, exactly, Dave. You know, it's all about the money. Um so Wait cash on me. I stay away from it. That's why I stay away. <laughs> that's why I stay away from backing my teams because I would have been twice as hot uh in that game. <laughs> that's why I don't bet on my teams, right? <laughs> Nibble, oh, man, what are your stay thoughts? away from betting on your teams. Never works. Yeah. Never Let's works. learn. Let's learn. The other day, Charles, your final thought. You know, Brian, I think Brian hit on something. And I, and that anxiety, that nervous en- energy, it was palpable through the stadium. And, and I say this, you know, the football IQ people were out yesterday. All right. It wasn't, you know, the band people where a fanfare can distract you, you know, 5,000 people. It, it, it was the football IQ people. Uh, that was sitting around. I mean, I, if I'm in the press box and I could hear somebody distinctly say, why are we in man on third and 16? You know, it was folks down the distance yesterday. And like I said, it was that, <laughs> it was that nervous energy, uh, especially in the third quarter. You know, it was, I could literally hear people, hey, Franklin's in the backfield. Look for the screen. You know, it was the football IQ. He <laughs> had it football game. He yes. got so you for the stands. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. It was <laughs> hilarious. But that was that made it a great football game because people were so in tune to every play. And you really got that sort of nervous uh, ebb and flow, uh, whether your team had the ball or could you make a stop on defense. So it was it was a great game. It lived up to the building. Before we go into break, I'm going to give a shout-out to V.J. Jones and the Southern faithful out there in terms of their big win over all corn at home. You can tell that, uh, you know, he's like, man, I had no expectation to the season. His chest kind of came out a little bit. Man, we dominated the game. I look at the stats. So I was like, I didn't know it dominate. They wasn't dominate. It was a close game. No, 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 no. Remember, Dr. They ran really well in that. Both teams ran really well, but they were able to, me, pass a little better than all corn, which is the difference in the game. Besides what they were able to do defensively, 
But let's take everyone this first break. Dominant. We'll come back on. Go ahead, Dave, real quick. Never forget, Dr. Cavill, everyone is dominant. <laughs> everyone is dominant. <laughs> I got you. You show right. Everyone is dominant. <laughs> everyone when is you're dominant. the one winning. With that being said, we're going to take a first break, come back on the other side, and we're going to unveil major division top seven in week number Eight. Ooh, it's getting close. It's past midterms. It's time to tighten up. We're going to see these test scores. It counts even more now. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Supermarket Sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? <laughs> oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Standard protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one too. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll it back, everybody. <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot of and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab. It's time to unveil Major Division Week number eight. We'll get into the top seven. But before we do that, we got to see if any team dropped out. There were actually two this week dropping out. The Howard Bison fall to three and four. They drop out of the poll. Alcorn State Braves, it looked like they were rolling. They've had to drop out. They're at four and four, three and one in the conference race now. Let's see those that are receiving votes. Alabama State Hornets continues as the top vote getter outside of the top seven. They are three and three, two and one, 141 points. They did not play last weekend. You got your Grambling State Tigers as they improve to four and three and get their first conference win as they are at 138 points. And you got the Alcorn State Braves that fall out, but they still in contention receiving votes. They're now four and four and three and one in the conference race with 125 points. So let's get into the top seven. At number seven, you have the Florida a and Riders, three and three, a one and one in the conference race, 157 points. They fall four spots from number three. Bring us to number six. And number six is the Hampton Pirates. They jumped back in the poll this week. They're at four and three, one and two in their conference race, 168 points after not being ranked. At number five. 
the Southern Jaguars jump into the top seven this week. Big mm-hmm. win for them. They are three and zero. They find a way to get it done. They're four and three uh, overall, and three and zero. More importantly for them in the conference race, specifically in the Western Division, with three big West Division wins. 176 points after not being ranked themselves uh, at all this entire season. Bring us to number four where you get a little leveling at the top to some degree. You have number four, South Carolina State Bulldogs. They do jump up a slot as they improve to four and two overall, 187 points as they were previous ranked five. Bring us to number three, Tennessee State Tigers. Even though they won, they Hmm. slide just a bit. They're six and two, three and one, one first place vote. 190 points, uh, and they slide from the two spot as Jackson State jumps all the way back up uh, to number two uh, from the four slot with their big win over a top five team. Jackson State improves the five and two, a three and oh, more importantly, I believe, uh, because of the divisional race. They add a couple of first place votes, uh, even take one uh, from the top team. Uh, they're at three first place votes, 221 points. One thing about Jackson State, can they hold this to the season? It seems like every time they get a little momentum going up to the top, they have a tough letdown. We'll see what that means after this. And the number one should not surprise anybody is North Carolina Central, 5-2, and 1-0 oh in the commerce race. They do drop a first-place vote, but they're still holding strong in seven, 223 points, and they remain at number one. In week number eight, you see it. That's your top seven uh, teams. Uh, in the poll rankings for week number eight. With that being said, let's go to Brandon yourself. What are your thoughts in terms of the top seven? I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, looking at the uh, top seven, um, obviously Jackson State got a got a big win in, uh, over FAMU, so that was weighed a lot. That that jumped them up to the number two spot. Um, I can assure you, I was not that that lone first place book vote that Tennessee State got. I was not responsible for that. <laughs> um, so I, I I can get why they why that that win may have dropped them down despite the uh, victory. Um, looking at uh, South Carolina State, obviously, uh, or <laughs> as Eddie Drew calls them, Benedict North, got a win over uh, their friends at Fort Valley State to keep things going there. So I don't have a problem with them at, at four. Um, that Southern gets uh, another win on homecoming over Alcorn. Uh, Hampton, them and Hampton jumped into in, into the rankings, and FAMU tumbles all the way down to um, seventh. I don't have too much of an of an issue with it. I'm taking I'm gonna take off my Tennessee State glasses on this one. Um I guess it's it's a fair poll. I think if Alabama State uh gets another win, they're gonna be knocking somebody out of this top seven uh Ooh. in next week's poll. That's who uh you gotta watch out for. But well, other other than that, you know, um I don't take too much exception uh with the poll, even with uh, us, us dropping down a slot. Nice job. You can put your Tennessee State glasses on if you like. <laughs> In your mind, did you see as a bigger win, Tennessee State going to Washington seat and defeating a top seven team at the time, Howard, or uh, you look at the fact that uh, Jackson State at home defeating FAMU? Uh, in I, and this is completely honest. I really think that I think that the, the Jackson State and FAMU game, because – as we have seen the, the past few years, and Dave touched on it earlier, it's been a, a de facto championship game. Whoever has, yeah, has won this game has, has has come out of uh, that division. So uh, to get that win and, and position themselves uh, to represent the Western Division in the championship game was huge. So because that game has such far-reaching ramifications from a potential uh, – from a conference standpoint – from a potential celebration bowl standpoint, um, it does weigh more because even if if Tennessee State goes up there and lays an egg and and they, they lose, it doesn't really affect them in terms of a div- conference standing because it's a non-conference yeah. game. It may affect them if you're looking at trying to get a, a postseason berth if you lose that game. But you know they they didn't have as much at stake so. Um, I can I can get with Jackson State jumping up to number two for that reason. Good good analysis, great analysis, Charles. 
I'm gonna go to you now. Mm-hmm. King of the Hill right now. What what are mm-hmm. your thoughts? Uh I, I think the poll looks about right. I'm 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 I was curious how far fam you would, would, would drop. I, I might have probably had them sitting there at five, but when you look at the records, the records are what they are. Southern is 3-0 uh, in, in, in swag play. So I, I can't argue that. I, I will say you posed a very interesting question in terms of Jackson State having momentum, and we've seen it before where they have momentum, and then there's inexplicably something happens along the way. And I was listening to C.C. Uh, Taylor in his press conference yesterday, and it was very interesting to me that he, you know, kept the blinders on, you know, knowing that Bethune Cookman is going to be a tough test. Uh, and he talked about the the lunch pail mentality of his team, how he really likes the makeup of that team. And he used a term that I thought was uh, very interesting where he called it we fence, you know, in terms of the offense and the defense, uh, being able to pull together in some type of way, find a way to get the victory yesterday. And I told him, I said, y- y- y'all need to call under armor and get those printed up fast because that's something that'll that's something that'll catch on, just the mentality of of the week, uh, in terms of, of getting everything done on offense and defense in some type of way, figuring out how to win games. And I think, you know, the fact that they the fact that he had mentioned that you know, we haven't taken our eyes off the prize. This team is built for December. That's going to be an interesting question going down the stretch with regards to this Jackson State football team. I really appreciate those pro, uh, comments, but T.C. Taylor is going to be mad at me. You know, last week I talked about the fact you had the collision course potentially of top 25 teams, top 15, maybe even top 10 teams with FAMU and North Carolina Central for the Celebration Bowl race um, in terms of that matchup. Well, that may take a back seat, Uh, but now we have uh, Jackson State that was a top 25 team, and they keep sliding up. Now you might have that T.C. Taylor matchup with North Carolina Central and uh, Trey Oliver uh, that coach with each other, uh, very familiar with each other. So HBC folks leading their alumni. It'd be interesting in that match. Uh, So collision course there. So I know T.C. Taylor's going to like, shut up. I'm about to say Hey, 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 yeah. Usually, he, I, he answered my text. I told him, Congratulations, thank you. And I invited him on the show. He quickly went silent. Not yet, not yet. I did it last time. I get a TC. We still cool. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Brian, uh, with Charles feeling so good about all this. Uh, you might have a different framework, but so please share it. Is that the oh, pregnant? Pre- oh, pregnant. sorry. Yeah, I was doing doing double duty here. Now, I didn't know if that was the pregnant pause on purpose there. You know how it is. <laughs> and I heard a little sniffle. I was like, hey, you going to start. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, what, well, what I, was, what I was looking at is I, I wanted to kind of – look at, at my personal top 10 and you know i still have uh i, I have jackson state at number two so i, I don't disagree with that um uh, in, interested in the in the three voters uh that that voted them first but i mean hey when you knock off the defending champs and you you uh you have the and, and it's interesting to say is it the most impressive fcs win you know because i you know, it, it may very well be. You know, is it yeah, more impressive than what North Carolina Central did at the beginning of the year? Is it more impressive than what they did on the road at Campbell? I mean, you know, it is what it is. But uh, I also, I, I'm watching my eyes are on Tennessee State. And that is the team that I, I, I'm very intrigued to see what those Tigers do um, because I, I got a feeling that they very well, they're playing up to the expectation that I think the data and the, the metrics have had of Tennessee State over the last couple seasons. The X factor. And, yeah. yeah. And so I think they got a quarterback now. And it's real interesting what your team looks like when you have good quarterback play. When you have good quarterback play, anything's possible. And I honestly think the top four teams – have some good quarterback play. So, right now, 
you know, I, I say that with all, you know, humility that I think the top four teams have some good quarterback play. And yes. uh, we'll, we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks. But um, it, it, it's fascinating when you when you kind of see where teams are. And, and, and then my, I'm going to give a special shout out there to uh, to uh, to Hampton. You know, I, I'm that's a team that I've quietly been rooting for. I was rooting for them last year, and they kind of they kind of let me down at the end of the season. But I but I know that was sort of based on some injuries. This year, look, that's a team that should have beat a top twenty team last week, and you know they came into Greensboro, and 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 you know I look, look my tweets were what they were, so I, I I had a little fun, Dave. I'm sorry, um, but I, I'm just one of the other Aggies went after you, not me. Yeah, you know, well, look, no Aggies saw the second half, so there was no Aggies to go after me. I mean, you know, I, I'm no worry, from... sir, sir, Hampton's highlights on Twitter was more than enough. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I, I'm deflecting shots from JSU people who are keeping receipts, you know, for the last 18, 24 months, you know, so it's and all I, good. And Brian, I'm getting texts now. They're telling me you look great in blue, man. Well, it is. <laughs> It's Sunday. It's cold blue, so don't get, don't get it twisted, Jackson State folks. It's Sunday is cold blue. Don't get, don't get. Don't get yeah, he raised that up real quick. I know, right? Yeah, it's it's cold Sunday. That's, you know, good points when you talk about Tennessee State. In the next segment, we will look at those schedules going forward of some of those teams in the top seven, particularly those that had big wins. We'll look at that. But I'd be remiss if I certainly. Uh, as you kind of shifted and allow us to go to Dave and get his thoughts in terms of top seven. I'll be honest. I think the big the big one for me is Hampton. I understand they're one and two in conference, but their two losses came up against top twenty five opponents. I think right. they should be higher on the field. I'm Good I point. understand Jackson going up to two, you know, I feel for Tennessee State because they did what they were supposed to do. They shouldn't fall. But when you beat a top twenty five team, that's what happens. That's you deserve to go up in rankings. Question if we put I think maybe you should be higher than seven. I'll probably shift Southern down, move Hampton and, and fan you up. Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, I think that's, so, I think that's reasonable, Dave. Uh, uh, you come in here, I'm, even I'm, though I'm it was a tough guy. homecoming, you're reasonable. You're a reasonable type of guy. I think one I, thing I that's interesting be. in this, and I'll bring it back to you, let you have a couple of more words uh, um, to, to full out your thoughts, um, is squarely the independents are in the top seven. We've pretty much seen that throughout the season. And we hadn't had a time. Uh, where your independents consistently were in the um, top seven with Tennessee State and Hampton Pirates being those two of the three teams. Go ahead, Dave. G give me some more on yeah. time. Yeah, I, I think I think what it ultimately boils down to it, right? The conference Hampton's schedule is pretty brutal, so their conference record is not going to be that strong. But they have like they have, like I said, they have two top twenty-five appointed Tennessee State. They're about to get through the meat of their schedule right now, because it's going to be fascinating to see how they do against your UT Martins and things of that sort. Um, but I, I think Hampton's a really good football team. They're still doing that two-quarterback platoon system. I think mm -hmm. they need to figure out one. I think it should be made, but, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get to it. I think they'll figure it out once they get in the, in the, in the skin of conference play. And, Charles, I'll let you come back here and get some more thoughts. Um, Dave, I want to remind folks that they can check us, check you out on Inside the yeah. HBC Sports Lab on Wednesday to, uh, with the Hampton crew. And sometimes Brandon is part of that team, and when it works out, he jumps in there to get a little more discussion. And I think with these teams playing at this level, uh, it gives a little more uh, fodder in terms of the independent talk that we haven't had uh, in years in regards to what it looks like um, from that perspective. Uh, with that being said, Charles, what did you want to add there? Well, I wanted to ask Brandon, like going down the stretch here, uh, UT Martin. Well, oh, well, well, Charles, okay. I want to do that in the next segment. I, okay. I, I okay. want to get that. Okay. So you're right. Yeah. We're going to do that. And I want to do that a little bit for FAMU. I want to look at it in terms of Dave, uh, A&T. Can they find a way to get a win? We're going to look at that. We're going to do it for Jackson State and Tennessee State. So you're right in the ballpark I want to do. We're going to do a hard out, come back, and get in that discussion. So perfect time and a great handoff. Stick with me right back after this break. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is always Ultra Thins reinvented with the always triple protection system. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. 
Rethink your pack for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eighth. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. This is Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love you. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Ville inside the HBC Sports Lab. Now we're starting to get these texts from these coaches and of those in administrative <laughs> positions and uh, uh, media folks. Come slow down, man. Slow down. Slow down. Let us do our work. Hello. <laughs> My job is to create storylines. I talked to I talked to John Grant. He's taught me well. Create the storyline. All rankings. He said it week to week. You all job is now I go back and tell the players be like, man, don't listen to nothing they say. <laughs> all the way back to the open up season with rat poison. Rat poison. <laughs> it works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, for the coaches that respect it all and, and give us to all that information there. And I know Brandon had to check out on that last segment. It's, uh he'd give us some much time uh, for that platform. But with that being said, Charles, you had a thought. We'll get in that that framework and we'll get it among everybody else to break it down and we'll kind of go around in terms of what that looks like but uh, open it up for what you were uh wanting to introduce in terms of some of these schedules as we go with it well just look at that down stretch of tennessee state uh they had ut martin at home they're on the road west illinois on the road against garden web and then they finish out at home against southeast and missouri state my question is they should be favored at least in three out of those four contests, but what's the field? Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting, particularly when that last game, it has to be uh, ha has a chance to be for it all in terms of the conference race. Yeah. Uh, winning it at this point, Southeast Missouri is seven and one. Uh, Tennessee State, obviously, everybody knows is six and two. And when you get in the conference race uh, between those teams, is uh, the Red Hawks uh, right are sitting at four and zero. Oh, while Tennessee State is three and one, and right behind them is the next matchup with T UT Martin, which is two and one. Um, and finally, they have the Leathernecks that are also sitting at two and one. So it's going to be uh, fascinating to see with that. I think Brandon is was able to jump back in here, so we'll kind of get his thoughts in terms of what that looks like once he jumps back in here. Uh, Charles had a question for you in terms of going down the the final part of the season. He talked about UT Martin, which sits at two and one in the conference race. This is your next matchup. Tennessee State is at home. Yeah, Tennessee State at Western Illinois, Tennessee State at Gardner Webb. And then you close out a season, which could be for a conference championship if things work out that way. With uh um, under the four and oh um Red Hawks team that sit at seven and one overall and Tennessee State at six and two. So if you would, Brandon, 
uh, as you get back into it. I think your phone there is teasing you, folks trying to get in touch with you, talk about that big win. We'll bring that back to you in terms of your thoughts on that matchup when you uh, get back to us. But let's look at the next one here with uh, A&T, because I know, Dave, you're about to jump on this plane and make sure you uh, get your seating spot. So let's look at A&T in terms of their final schedule uh, and kind of get your thoughts and whether they can find a place to get get a win. And I say this in all seriousness, not to jaw at you, but yeah, as no. we like to break it down, as you know, what is this talking about? And you've talked about consistently the number of points that A&T has given up on defense. I think it's frustrated you even more of what you've seen on offense uh, and the number of yards. So now they have a Campbell team sits in two and five. Maybe that's the best one. Uh, it doesn't get any easier with William and Mary, uh, Villanova, top 25 team. Uh, you got Townsend that's playing about 500 ball. And then you close it out with Elon. A two and five. So there's some spaces in their teams, at least record wise, uh, that that could put you in a position maybe to to get another win against the FCS poll. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so that there's there's three opportunities, and it's Campbell next week. Um, mm-hmm. Elon's our home closing. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we on the road in Townsend. We we've had a habit of playing better on the road, believe it or not, in the yep. in the Victor Brown era. Um, so we're going to clip somebody on the road, and it could be next week against Campbell, but we have to be able to have some level of a run game. Um, over the past few weeks, our run game has been thousand, but we've lost our top two running backs. Kenji Cook is out for the year, um, and and uh, Wesley Graves is out for the year. So we're we're, we're on our third three running back right now, and last week, well, yesterday against Hampton, we had under 60 yards rushing. You're not going to win football games like that, considering that left foot. The offense wants to do. Um, Fambi, Justin Fambi is the backup quarterback. I started the quarterback is off for the season as well. Um, so he is more of a pocket passer, not a scrambler like that. Um, but he's also a gun clinker. He's willing to take risks, and I think folks who watched the game yesterday will see some of the risks that he's willing to take. Um, but from that standpoint, I think our best passes are going to be between Campbell and Elon. Elon, surprisingly, is not doing nearly as well as what folks thought prior to the season. Mm-hmm. Um, and Townsend's going to be interesting on the road, but I don't see us being able to, to do what we did against Richmond uh, prior to the bye week. So we kind of almost had a legitimate shot to beat Richmond on the road. Uh, we had a 10 0 lead, gave up 20 unanswered, came back, fumbled when we had a go to go to score. It was kind of brutal. Um, but I just I just need to see something from the defensive football team, offensively, try to get our run game. Back and going, I think we might have a shot to maybe pull one up set out of those those three games. I just I'm very fair, up. very fair assessment. And and one thing that you seems when you're watching A and T is they can play some pretty good football, but when those wheels start to roll off, I mean they just disintegrate. It ain't like something like this. They just go left and it like pops off. But the question I really wanted to ask you, you know, before we take this break, to allow you to jump off and, and get on that flight, and we'll come back and talk about the rest of some other key schedules with Charles and Brian. Um, where, where is the fan base? And I know you will give a nice assessment in terms of with the project, not necessarily with the coach or the move. You told a lot of folks that there were going to be some times to kind of look at this in, in regards to, um, you know, it's going to take time. What are you hearing? Are they still – on board, or is it broken up in different compartments? You know, I'm sure those that never wanted to leave, they're using all this as their ammunition. Yeah, and the, and the crazy thing is, whenever they use this as ammunition, the first thing I say is, we've lost to South Carolina State. We've lost to North Carolina Central. We've lost. Yeah. Yep. So, so going back to the MEAC isn't going to change the fact of all these losses, right? But right. I think right, I think right now, um, the fan base has been patient, but I think the patience is, has every to build in at this point. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think I think it's like I think there's still some who are trying to bring out hope, but I don't know if that that final sum can stomach in a one in eleven season. Thank you for sharing. So, yep. And giving us that, that honest perspective. Well let me let you get in there. We're gonna take a next break. We'll come back on the other side. Appreciate you coming on this Sunday morning and give us some great analysis if, if, as you always do. Check out Dave. He does a couple of platforms, obviously, with the Panthers, Sunday football. Uh, he gives his other show in 
um, in terms of bringing up with us. And then he has his components on the HBCU nightly, and you check them out tonight as well. With that, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back on the other side, get some final thoughts of scheduling breakdowns, uh, and then we'll close it out for Sunday to folks get ready uh, as they head to church or get into some other football and specifically get ready for tonight's shows to give you an HBCU perspective uh, with HBCU nightly as well as making sure you catch up with Brian in AD Sports Wrap. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this last break. Looking for the ultimate cultural experience of 2025? The Zora Outdoor Festival of the Arts is where you need to be. From January 31st to February 2nd, Eatonville, Florida will come alive with incredible live performances from the Levert Experience and Sunshine Anderson. Immerse yourself in interactive art. Take a journey through history with a new virtual tour app that brings Eatonville's legacy to life from your phone. Enjoy family-friendly STEM activities and explore over 80 unique vendors. Please don't miss the unforgettable R&B tribute to the legends. This is more than a festival. It's a celebration of Eatonville's rich cultural heritage. Visit ZoraFestival.org for tickets or to become a vendor. We'll see you in Eatonville, the oldest black incorporated municipality in the country. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. And pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Will inside the HBC Sports Lab. As we have the swag heads, we'll get into that, talk about the little end of the season. We'll even sneak in with some MEAC uh, in terms of that. And we'll get a chance maybe to talk a little bit about some of these tie breaks. I think there's a lot of questions after such high matchups. What does this mean in terms of tiebreakers? And a lot of good information out there. We won't get too specific in what those tiebreakers. We'll save that uh, for next week as we pull out the actual documents so you can see those top five tiebreakers. But there's some that are pretty straightforward, and we'll give you that information as well. As we get into it, let's kind of look down the stretch at some of these schedules, which will get us even more information of what maybe some of these tiebreakers will look like. This is the remaining schedule for Jackson State. Jackson State next week gets right back into it as they close out the season on a conference slate. Uh, they're at Bethune-Cookman. That is currently 1-6. and six. Uh, They host Arkansas Pine Bluff. Those Golden Lions are at 2-5. and five. You have Mississippi Valley State comes to Jackson. That's 0-7. Then they close out on the road, which makes things a little more interesting. They have Alabama State currently at 3-3. Three and, three. and Then they have the big rivalry game with Alcorn State sitting at 4-4. Four and four. Braves fall after a tough loss Southern. Um, let's go into FAMU uh, to kind of give you their final uh, games. And remember, they have a game that they have to make up, so that stretches things out a little more than normal uh, that comes at the end of the season when they traditionally – Close out like Jackson State and all corner against rivals. They have another game on the slate. So you have Southern uh, at FAMU uh, next week. Uh, you got Texas Southern coming to FAMU. That's homecoming. Then they travel to Prairie View. Uh, long road trip uh, there. They'll be on planes, I'm sure. Mississippi Valley at FAMU. And you have the rivalry game to Florida Classic, Florida Blue, Florida Classic. That's FAMU at Bethune-Cookman. Then the makeup game is the week after, which is Alabama A&M at FAMU. So there's some intrigue in terms of some of those matchups. Again, I want to take a little liberty and talk about this side of the house where it really gets interesting in the Southern Division. We just talked about Southern traveling to FAMU. Next weekend, you have Southern at Alabama A&M. You have Bethune-Cookman coming to Southern. As Southern closes out the season, Check this out. With three home games, Bethune Cookman at Southern, I just mentioned. Arkansas Pine Bluff comes to Southern. And then, uh, while they'll be the home team, obviously, in this case, you have the Bayou Classic with Grambling and Southern, should be interesting. And that game is in New Orleans. Brandon, congratulations. I see Fatherhood has you uh, doing your duties there. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make sure we acknowledge that. A great fatherhood there. I love it. I love it with the twins. Uh, Alcorn State, when you look at them, they have Alabama State coming to Alcorn. 
Uh, they have uh, Texas Southern as well. Then they go on the road to Prairie View, and then they have the big rivalry game, just told you, with them uh, hosting uh, Jackson State in terms of that matchup. So interesting a little bit there in terms of just in general. Um, and we'll put this back out here because you were kind of mixing up a little bit there. Uh, the end, we talked about Tennessee State's season as they have a chance to close things out in their last game if they can hold things up. Could be for a conference championship. But in general, kind of what are your thoughts uh, with those schedules? I'll start with you, Brian. What's on your mind in terms of schedule? Anything stand out to you, those breakdowns on the schedules? Well, you know, for for FAMU, I, I think what's interesting is seeing that five, you know, here we are getting into the last six games of the season, right? Five of the last six games are in the state of Florida with four of those five being in Bragg Stadium. Um, where, you know, the Rattlers have a, a, a nice winning streak. So that does give a little bit of confidence um, despite all of the chaos and, and panic and feelings that Rattler Nation has. Um, Southern is coming to the town. It's coming to town this Saturday. Uh, feeling pretty good about that. Um, but Southern, it'll be interesting. W which Southern are we going to get? And so uh, how the team responds after this game will be will be interesting. But I think what, honestly, what Rattler Nation is, is going to be looking at is they're looking over at, uh, across the aisle, looking over at Jackson State schedule. <laughs> I mean, honestly. I mean, people are already... Oh, that's right. I like that. They, no, people hey, are doing that. Your over there. <laughs> over there. <laughs> Let's just clear something up. One, fam, you will not have an opportunity to go to the playoffs due to the rescheduling of the Alabama a and game. Good which theory. is moved to the first weekend of the FCS playoffs. So that instantly eliminates us from even considering the playoffs. So it's all or nothing at this point for FAMU. It's either, hey, somehow the next three games for Jackson State, you're looking at like, yeah, okay, they should win, they should win. And then we get to the last two games, and you're looking at Alabama State and Alcorn. So for the FAMU side of things, FAMU will be rooting for Alabama State, which we rarely do, and we'll be rooting for Alcorn. I mean, honestly, you know, because that's what it'll take. It'll take two losses for FAMU to have an opportunity should they handle their business. Again, in four years now being in the SWAT, we have only lost to one team. Hmm. So that is that gives confidence. Despite everything going on, it does give us confidence that – we just got to do our job, and then we'll see what Jackson State does, whether they handle their business or whether they trip up at the finish line. Who knows? But you can only control what you can control. And so I'm, I'm sure that'll be the message today when Coach Coles gets the team uh, to, to block out the noise, trust each other, trust your coaches, and handle your business each week 1-0. and And, you know, we'll worry about what happens after November 29th on November 29th. Brandon, I feel like we're in the courtroom, so I'm gonna go to Charles to ask him to retort. Uh, the retort is if Jackson State just handles business, uh, fam, you can start practicing jump shots. I mean, that's that's <laughs> there's there's that there's that reality if they just handle their business. Meaning, again, like I said, it struck me. That you know, most coaches they don't they want to save the victory. They don't want to look at you know they don't want to talk about the next opponent. Let me enjoy this for twenty four hours. And it struck me that TC said our blinders are still on. Our 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 goals are haven't been accomplished with this win. So that that jumped out at me. So they're taking Bethune Cookman seriously. UAPB comes in for homecoming. That's a good football team in UAPB. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen what they've been able to do. Uh, Valley. Always plays Jackson State hard. Just that's it's just what it is. Okay, and then of course you got off on the rivalry game. So and and for and for the people texting me right now, Doc, can you do this? Just help 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 a Jackson State fan out. You know because Brian mentioned you know that everybody's going to be paying attention to Alabama State and Alcorn. Alcorn now in the West. From a tiebreaker standpoint, what what does it mean? Appreciate you putting that on the table, and we'll close out, and I'll give you a tiebreaker and kind of break it down. I think we'll get a chance to, to really go through that. Before I do that, Brandon, I'm going to ask you this from this perspective. You know, what 
do you think the likelihood of that last game against the Red Hawks, uh, how likely do you think that will be for a conference championship? Um, if they take care of business um, in the three preceding games, because they've got um, they've got a bye. Kind of a coach. <laughs> <laughs> A really good media person like that. If they take care of it, go ahead. <laughs> you know, they've got uh, UT Martin um, coming in. Um, they're, they're two and one in conference. So, and that that's not a gimme. Uh, right. They had a very, very uh, close game last year. And, and Martin actually played earlier this season. SEMO, they only lost by them to three points in overtime. And SEMO has, has been... Uh, the, the the class of the Big South OVC, uh, so that's a team that you've got to take seriously. Um, when you look at Western Illinois <clears throat> right now, uh, they've won a couple straight, but defensively they're still they're very offensive user friendly. Um, they're giving up about forty two and a half points per game <laughs> on the offensive side of the ball, uh, so there, there's going to be some opportunities there. I think that's a game that they should win, and they, they have to win. So going into this this last game against uh, Southeast Missouri, they didn't play last year. They played in 22, and Simo housed them 42 to nothing. Uh, Gino right. has ran wild all over the dudes like, like – <laughs> Uh, I hope a maniac should, but it was. It, <laughs> Brandon, let me ask you this: this funny, this this funny question, and it may be harder to ask, and you might um, not even want to answer and choose to send it for another time. You know, with all the anticipation of this game against Howard, all the excitement, all the talk that the band wouldn't be there, and people's disappointment, and all that, I think it's intriguing that this year. With, with the teams in the top seven, FAMU, Tennessee State, and Jackson. And those rivalry games go back for a while for different reasons, particularly in classes. You know, how long is it going to take you to compete with new president and administration that it's time to get into the conference? What, 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 what are you doing here, man? What are you doing? Well, <laughs> that's all right. I'm sorry to take a deep breath. I don't want you to get in trouble with any alumni presidents. You still need to keep your media pass. So we're going to let you think about that. We'll talk about that off record. So I, I'll take that on. With that, <laughs> with that being said, let's get into the question that Charles had, the more serious question, so we can close this up. So, as you know, um, the, East, the Eastern Division and the Western Division will play against each other for a championship game. The team with the best overall record gets to host the game. Uh, whether they're out of the East or the West. Uh, since the expansion, those games have come out of the Eastern Division. Specifically, uh, we should just point it out that it's between Ben and Jackson, <laughs> Mississippi, or Tallahassee, Florida, meaning between Jackson State and FAMU. And any indications, that might be the same this year. So people wanting to know, tiebreakers. Your first tiebreaker is division is your overall record but what is the head-to-head? -head? So if FAMU, if Jackson State somehow slips up and both teams end the season at 7-1, and one, the first tiebreak will be head-to-head. -head. What was the matchup between FAMU and Jackson State? We have that on the record. It's finished. Jackson State won that game. Therefore, they would uh, win the tiebreak. Right? If it's three teams, somehow – Alabama State, Alabama, I mean, Alabama State, I should say, FAMU and Jackson State all end up with a 7-1 record in this scenario. Uh, it's still a head-to-head -head tiebreaker, but in this case, all the teams would have beat each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the next one is record of tied teams within the division. So who has the best record between those teams as you go down? You look at division play. Who has the best record? Who finished five and one? Who finished four and two? Right? Then you go to head to head competition versus the team within the division with the best overall division and non division conference records proceeding through the division. So that means after you do that, let's say all teams beat each other, all teams had the same record within the division. Now you go back and say, all right, we're going to look at the whole teams. What was your record 
against everybody in the SWAC and who had the best record. And you look at it based on who's at the top. So you proceed all the way down until you have the tiebreaker broken. So what these teams want to look at for Jackson State, they just want to win out. FAMU wants to find a way uh, that either Jackson State loses twice or that Alabama State muddies it up and gets in the mix. But then they want to make sure that they have a better record against the top team at the top. So this matchup against FAMU and Southern next week becomes even more important. Obviously, you can't forward another loss, but you would like to see Southern. If you're FAMU, you want Southern. Uh, you want to beat Southern, obviously. But after that, you want Southern to continue to win because they would have a better record. Jackson State game against Southern did not count in the standings. So now their next best win would be over the second place team. Therefore, FAMU would win the three-way tiebreaker in that case, meaning that Alabama State didn't beat Southern either. So those are the ways that you want to look at two team tiebreakers and three team tiebreakers. Those are some of the examples out there uh, in terms of the tiebreaker. What are your Let thoughts? Me ask it. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, Doc, what, what's interesting, given the given the the scheduling change of the FAMU Alabama A&M game, next week's Magic City Classic, or I should say Saturday's Magic City Classic, becomes very important in that scenario. Yeah. Correct. Because let's just, you know, let's go with all intents and purposes. If AM were to win that game, right? They having a loss to Jackson State kind of makes it interesting later on in the year. Let's just say the Bulldogs end up winning out, beating Alabama State. That means now that That's game right. at the end of the year becomes interesting should Jackson State stumble there at the end of the year. So there's two right. different ways that this scenario, this three-team mythical scenario that Rattler Nation specifically is holding on to, um, <laughs> you know, because that's, that's reality. Jackson State just knows control their destiny, win and end. But the next week's Magic City Classic goes a long way in sort of shaping what the narrative looks like later on in the season. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about um, the conference race. You know, it's not just the one-game scenario, uh, the head-to-head -head matchup, which is extremely important, but you're also looking at the race in terms of tie scenarios, who has to win. So each week, as we go down the stretch, whether you're looking at the Western Division or the Eastern Division, these matchups are extremely important. Particularly, we always follow divisional, but these intradivisional matchups become just as important yeah. when you start looking down the stretch and not just in case of wins, but more so uh, in terms of the tiebreakers. So yes, those overall records become important. So two team ties again, A is head to head competition between the two tied teams, records of the tied teams within the division, head to head competition versus the team within the division for best overall division and non-divisional conference races proceeding through the division, multiple ties within uh, the division will bro be broken up first to last. Overall record ver versus non-divisional teams uh, is the next. And then E is combined records versus all common non-division teams. Records versus common division teams with the best overall records uh, is how you proceed. So these are some of the things when you get into who's hosting, it becomes even more interesting if you had teams with tied records uh, at the end. Obviously, you had head-to-head -head matchups, and so those why it becomes record. And then you have the number four, which is interesting to me, football championship subdivision coaches poll ranking can come into play if the tiebreakers get that far down. So it's set up. Um, you can read this on the SWAC page. They have the tiebreaker just uh, so people understand where I'm getting this information from, and there will be a lot of talk uh, between now and the end of the season each week after somebody wins or loses and where they get to that ledge and how far they get and what they scoop back, as Charles likes to talk about, you'll see where it comes from there. With that being said, it's time to tie a bow in this. We gave you your major division matchups, so now you can see where teams talk about. We'll get into some rankings on Tuesday. We'll release the mid-major, and then we'll get into some of those top seven, top ten matchups uh, from the poll rankings, whether it's mid-major or major division, because we're going down the stretch now, Charles. Brian and Brandon, it starts to get good. It's big time. Thank we you. Got some, got some, got some head turn games coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's starting off with that FAMU and Southern. 
Uh, thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Nyata Kavil, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop, uh, along with Brandon King of sneakershop.talk.com. Make sure you go check out his his page does some great write-ups, particularly when he talks about the matchups of Tennessee State. Release our poll write-up is also on his page as well. And just some good other good talk. We have one that's going to come out here uh, where we're going to get into you and talk about what it looks like for conference expansion. We'll talk about that a little later. That's a nice little tease uh, where he really gets into a great breakdown uh, in terms of what uh, imaginary fool, April Fool's Day uh, would look like maybe. Brian? Does his thing. Make sure you tune in to him tonight with Sports Wrap. He'll give you uh, all the need to close out your season as well as open it up for the week. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and th- Thursday. As you see, I have my Prairie View gear on. It's homecoming week. I have to get on the road and go to Washington, D.C., so I'm going to see some of those sad faces as I'm on Howard Bison campus. I'm going to make sure I let them know that Brandon King has no sorrow, so uh, <laughs> the deans of HBCUs get to mix it up a little bit there, but I'll be back uh, and heading straight to Prairie View for homecoming, so just wanted the people to know that. Follow me as we look forward to next week and discuss some more of uh, the news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as DR. K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. It's inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. I call it Twitter because I can. Uh, Facebook and YouTube is inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Brandon? Lecture. Brian? Dismissed.